Hey everybody and welcome to part 5 of my analysis of the European final in 2022 between Clapham and Ranala. This part is all about the conclusions and the summaries, looking at the most impactful aspects of the game. First player we're going to look at is Sam Murphy from Ranala. Murphy had a really good game. He gets a D here very early on, punishing Orcock for not quite cutting at the right kind of angle. He's right there with the layout block to cash in on that mistake. He gets another D here this time, a poach coming off the front of the stack, reading the play, seeing that the up line is coming and just committing to it early. He was a favorite target of Rogers, going deep, very difficult to stop here. McHale's on him, but he reads the disc a bit better, gets into the right position. He was also a big threat when the disc is just outside the end zone. Here he gets pretty much every other pass, forcing the defense to switch with his threatening moves, threatening the break throws when they're on, taking the easy dumps, offering return passes uh, with give-go moves, moving the disc laterally across, swinging it back, just doing everything right, showing that he's not just going to be catching it in the end zone. He's also very, very comfortable getting the disc in his hands a lot of the time, staying back if that's what the defender's giving him, and ultimately moving it around so that then it generates a scoring opportunity. Connection with Rodgers is very strong. Here he just puts his hand out subtly, knowing that Rodgers can hit that throw, not wasting any energy on excess cutting. Hits the immediate continuation. Comes under here and turns and gets the disc moving forward against the zone. Of course he had some incredible athletic plays as well. Towing the disc in to save it here, right in the far corner of the end zone. Going up line and throwing pinpoint into the zone for a goal quite late on in the game. And then also showing on defense how aware he is, switching here to stifle the undercuts twice against Clapham late in the game. These are the kind of moves that can have a big impact, even if it's not directly felt. Another athletic play on the sideline this time, getting to the line, stopping catching before falling forwards, saving the disc again. And then at the very end of the game, he gets the disc and the stall gets up high. And then to quote his coach, Ian French, for Sam Murphy to be on a high stall count and have the awareness of space and the touch to put this into the space only the offense could get is a staggering display of coolness under pressure and probably the highest skill moment I've seen from a player I coach. That's from Ian French's Better Everyday Coaching. Recommend you check that out. The next player we're going to take a closer look at is McNamara from Ranla. McNamara scores Ranla's important second and fourth points of the game. He does have a drop early on in the game too, this is the first turn of the game, but the rest of the game proves that it's uncharacteristic. He's well positioned to mop up this D, and then he gets the disc moving with a lefty backhand. Now these lefty backhands ended up being quite impactful in the game. Here against the zone, he receives the disc, fakes the lefty, and then pops the disc through. And then next time he gets it, he actually throws that lefty right through the defense and seemingly effortlessly, and that gets the disc moving quite quickly. He gets taken out by Justin Ford, uh, but he's able to get up and play on. And straight out of the stoppage, again, a lefty backhand, just showing how comfortable he is throwing with either hand. Again here, getting the disc in the middle of the field, slotting it through with a lefty, receiving it back, and then another no-pivot, quick lefty backhand, which opens up a good scoring opportunity. He's still making a big impact towards the end of the game, assisting this for the penultimate point, and then in the very last point, making the game-saving grab against Justin Ford to keep possession of the disc. So McNamara had a great game, had a big impact on the final result, and was able to throw with both hands more comfortably than anyone else on the field. so amazing, I think you kind of have to let it go. Now we're going to have a look at some of the problems Clapham had with synchronization, starting with looking at Ollie Gordon's game. He gets poached off a few times and is not able to actually convert that into any kind of meaningful impact. Here, the mark covers him going up line. With this play, his defender poaches off to cover the deep and he doesn't react until too late and then actually receives the disc backwards. Problems also happen with synchronization related to Gordon. 
They're moving across the field here at the same time as Lexi, opening up a big space, so maybe not the worst thing in the world, but the next pass has to be a little bit longer than is comfortable. Here the double cutting and then offering a get out option, which kind of teases the defense into having a bid, kind of lucky to get away with that. Molly was involved in both turnovers where the thrower was presented with two continuation options at the same time. Each time he was making the more traditional dump swing move whilst his teammates were going for the give go, moving the disc across the field. So let's take a look at Ferdia Rogers and his impact on the game. He had powerful upline moves, which he shows right from the beginning of the match. And he plays a critical role in some of the most important moments of the game. After he catches, he's facing in field, opening up the pitch for the rest of his teammates. His quick give go moves round the back, this time with Feely, open up scoring opportunities. He's always threatening the up line, this time it goes deep. When the disc is outside the end zone and they need to be patient, he's communicating, he's making the right moves at the right time, he's occupying multiple defenders wherever he goes. And even if he doesn't touch the disc, he's creating the spaces that his teammates are able to use. Again, facing in field and just putting the disc out to the big space to hit Murphy. Dynamic throwing technique to be able to fall over whilst throwing this break for the goal. Um, and his deep throws are money. Here's this one to Murphy again, just going out in front, giving the receiver what he needs to turn it into a goal. And in Universe Point, he combined many of these virtues, moving the disc around the back, threatening up line, forcing Clapham to switch. And then still in Universe Point here, getting the high impact up line move, getting the disc then to the middle of the field, and ultimately making the game winning cut and catch. There's the lefty leading pass. There's Rogers chasing it down. And in what has to be considered a metaphor, Rogers plows over Justin Ford to get the winning score. The next thing we're going to look at is Ashley Yeo's Stool Zero game. Ashley Yeo has an unparalleled ability to keep the disc moving without the stool count reaching one. He's building an attack every time he gets the disc, he's opening up the defense, and it's generating plenty of good flow opportunities which lead to good scoring opportunities for his team. Now I am biased because I coached him when he started playing in 2009 at Sussex Uni and then when he rejoined Sussex Uni again in 2017 he got to play with a lot of players who I've been coaching uh, flow offense to and he says that that had an impact on how he now plays the game. So what he's doing is applying a couple of principles. When he gets the disc his first look is to see if anyone is open in front of him or continuing the flow of the disc. A lot of the time he's looking to immediately get the disc back to the person that threw it to him. This player is often quite open. As he throws the disc, he's moving to receive the return pass. So he's applying return pass principles in two ways. One, he's looking for the return pass after he catches the disc. And two, he's looking to receive a return pass after throwing the disc. He's also turning inwards fairly consistently, keeping the previous thrower in vision, which allows him to move the disc a lot quicker. And these moves that he's making are always facilitating and building upon the attack that Clapham are creating. As well as this unmatched quick play in the short field, he is also a big deep threat. And so very difficult to mark as he has to be guarded both going towards the disc and going away from it. Otherwise, yeah, he will score deep in the end zone if you give him half the chance. He also had a play on defense, getting around McNamara and getting up high to get full palm on this disc, which, unfortunately for him, fell into the hands of Randler anyway. Now we're going to look at the switching and sharing of marks done by the two teams. Clapham did a fair amount of switching. Here on the far side, they negate both the deep cut and the undercut. Sometimes it was ripped apart by Ranala. Ford here expecting deep help from Yo, which comes at a fraction of a second too late. Clapham had to do a fair amount of buzz switching to stop Ranala's upline moves. Uh, he's usually done well, but occasionally there was some confusion, which would lead to one player being double marked for a second or two. 
Clapham would sometimes play coordinated team defence, here a poach requiring awareness from multiple other players to cover the threats as they appear, but Ranel are doing well to keep their patience and punish the spaces that open up. Ranel had some switching, Murphy we saw earlier here, making a couple of switches in quick succession to stifle the undercuts. Also McNamara here taking the initiative to pick up an active cutter. Sometimes Clapham were out of sync on defence, as we saw earlier with some players trying to work together and others being oblivious to the effort. Usually Clapham's team defence to surround the stack and share marks would completely stifle Ranler's vertical stack pool play. Multiple times they forced the disc to go backwards, which is a really good result of the pool. They would come down with rolls rather than marks and pick up players as they began to move. This worked really well due to the clustered nature of vertical stack. See here again, there's just nothing downfield. Ranel have to work their way into the defense and then start backing off as Clapham pick up players. And again here, as Clapham come down, watching the disc, covering the spaces, surrounding that stack. But when Ranala switched to horizontal plays, this countered Clapham's initial defense and caused some confusion, which led to a few easy goals. Here, McHale getting beat deep, maybe expecting some help, but then not being any there. And again here, just a few big cuts, opening up big spaces. So the horizontal was a good counter for the surrounding of the vert stack. Clapham should maybe alter their defense depending on whether they're facing a vert or horizontal as they run down the pool. Clapham's brick mark plays were lacking with players following a prescribed plan to create and use space to complete one pass, putting too many eggs into one basket really. And that basket, even if it worked, it wasn't going to be particularly great for either initiating flow or creating a score. Long. Disc in hand. Pressure mounting, gets that one. It goes over the top and Nolte tears it down! Clapham play more of a passing game and Ranala play more of a shooting game. Let's take a dive into the statistics to see what they say. You would too if you played with them as much as Rogers does. Now I recorded some stats on this game with a focus on the length of passes being attempted, whether they were contested or not, um, what number of pass in the possession those passes came on and the average stall count of the last two passes before that throw. One table for goals and one table for turnovers. We don't need to pause because we're going to come back to these. So to clarify, when I'm saying that the pass is contested, that's where the receiver has to do something to prevent the defender from getting the disc. So either boxing out or bidding against them. Long passes were counted as around half the field. So this one, like mid-range pass, I wouldn't say that that's a long one. I didn't record it as such. And now we get into the long one. I'm counting this one as a long pass. So that's roughly kind of where I'm drawing the line. Clapham's only contested long goal was this one from Ford to Yo towards the end of the game, which was a fairly comfortable box out for Yo, but still contested. Clapham's three other long throws for goals weren't contested. Ranala, on the other hand, threw five long passes for goals where the defender had a good bid including this one which actually touched two defenders before it was caught. If we look at the stats for the passes which resulted in goals, then we can see that Ranala's goals came from long passes over half the time. Uh, for Clapham it was about a third of the goals were from long passes. Let's have a look at where the turnovers are coming from. Clapham turned 11 times in total and Ranala turned 10 times. Two of Clapham's turns came from Hux, McNamara contesting this one to Yo and a crowd getting under this one from Wilson. Ranala's only deep throw which resulted in a turnover was this one which Wilson catches. If we look again, Ranala were successful on 90% of their long throws, even though 60% of them were contested. So Ranala took on a lot more of the big players and asked the receivers to do a lot more, and they came through for them, winning those aerial battles. If we look at the number of passes and the pass rate, we see Ranala are taking their shots early in the possession, with only two possession which results in goals lasting longer than six passes. Looking at the turnovers, almost half of Ranala's turns came in possessions that lasted more than six passes. Clapham's turns came from much longer possessions. Going over ten passes seems to be a threshold for them, 
but their goals also mostly came from longer possessions. Eight out of their 14 goals came from possessions that lasted some more than six passes. So how did the turnovers happen when they had the long possessions? Well, a lot of them were poached Ds at the beginning. We see Murphy here with a D on the sixth pass of possession. We've got this one from Fletcher on the 23rd pass. A poach from McNulty on the 14th pass. So it's fair to say that Clapham had troubles sustaining their offense after it got going. And this was usually because of poor spacing or inactivity, which Randler were punishing with poachers. Towards the end of the game, Randler were less directly involved in Clapham's turnovers, with four critical unforced turnovers happening whilst Clapham were in flow. Abrams passed across the back, here being stretched a bit too far. McHale adjusting late for Gordon double cutting to the continuation space and again the double cut to the continuation space and the pressure on the force contributing to this one and finally Mead turfing a swing on the 12th pass in one of these last possessions. So the spacing was still an issue towards the end of the game but it was Clapham who were cracking under the pressure. Ranola had this one pass taken away by Justin Ford, they had their incomplete huck but most of their other turns were relatively unforced. They threw it behind the reset, there was a miscommunication between Feely and this undercut, and again a miscommunication involving Feely when the cutter clears out when they're free. Good general pressure by Clapham to reach this high stall, but the thrower's balance control is primarily to blame here. Late in the game, Rogers got zone eyes. There was an overthrow to space, which the layout bid couldn't save, and a drop on a short pass just after getting a turnover themselves. So there were a couple of turns there where the throwers were perhaps getting a bit greedy, but the riskier throws were working out for them, even if Clapham were getting bids in. Clapham really only had a direct say in two of Ranola's ten turnovers this game, whereas Ranola directly impacted seven out of Clapham's eleven. But you don't need a five-part analysis series to tell you that Randler liked to throw it deep more than Clapham, and it worked out for them in this game. So what can we extrapolate further from that? Well, there's many different ways that you can successfully play this game. When I won European Championships with Brighton, we were very much playing a deep game where all the players know each other really well, they know what they like to throw, um, and they play a lot more on the trust and the connections as Randler do. And it's enjoyable and, yeah, you can achieve greatness, you can win Europeans playing that. But the question is what's going to work on the world stage? The offences were defined in this game by Ranola completing the long passes, winning the aerial battles, um, and Clapham turning over unforced after long possessions. When you get to the world stage, the thing that increases the most is the athleticism across the board. The deep throwing and the aerial game is what America thrive at. We saw in the USA-Japan match, many USA goals were just from winning those aerial battles. So when you take the offense to Worlds, you meet a barrier because all those players are bigger and more athletic than you're used to. What worked on the European stage is now suddenly going to get much harder on the world stage. Clapham's turnovers came mostly from being out of sync and Ranola punishing that with poachers rather than any kind of athletic dominance. Later in the game it was relatively unforced execution errors, which is something that Clapham just need to improve on themselves. It doesn't depend on their opponents. So what I'm trying to say is that Clapham's offense can be taken to Worlds and improved on and will work against the opponents there. However, Ranola's offense if it relies on the deep game and winning those contested hucks, then it's going to stop working when you get to the world stage. There's a certain self-reliance and robustness that comes with an offense that can work the disc around and score goals with short passes. Clapham's offense has been moving towards that flowing style recently, and they have seen more success at Worlds thanks to it. And to be fair to Ranola, they had a good showing in some games at Worlds, they won some of those battles, but they finished 22nd whilst Clapham finished 3rd. It's easy for me to sit here with the results of Worlds and come up with a takeaway from this game which fits both that story and supports the style of Ultimate that I like seeing being played. When I haven't dived into the what games and I'm able to just pick whichever clips support that theory, confirmation bias is going to be a factor for any analyst. But the US athletic dominance isn't a new or a controversial take. The statistics are pretty clear and I've had this take for a long time, 
because it dates back to my formative experience as a player, which we'll take a look at soon. I was watching Hoagie's live stream and he was reacting to the last part of this series and it got me thinking about the biases that I have as an analyst and where those biases come from. So that's what we're going to look at next. The inventor of the innovative hex offense and flex defense. Did he invent it or did he just discover it? Was it always there? If one of my conclusions is going to be that Clapham's offense has got more potential than Ranola's on the world stage, even though Clapham just lost to Ranola's deep game in the European final, then as well as understanding the reasoning behind that, we should look at the biases that I might have as an analyst. Is it just that I'm overexcited about dribbling and hex? Like, what is going on really? To understand my biases, we need to look at the formative experiences that I've had playing the game. I played for Brighton back in the noughties and we used big spaces. Uh, we didn't have much structure, trusted each other, big throwers and big receivers. And we had a lot of success with it and won Euros in 2009. But then when we got to Worlds, the deep game started working as well. So we were able to hold our own, we were able to get some blocks and put some points on the board. But when it came to the crunch situations, we had people looking at the end zone, looking for our big throws that would normally get us out of a tricky situation. And this time they weren't working. I'd had like a combo experience of being a deep receiver at the club level and a handler at the university level. So I was happy to switch the game up and try and work it short, but my teammates would fall back on what used to be working for us, thrown deep to the end zone. And it was much harder. We found that we were reaching dead ends and the tighter a game got towards the end, more that we would go towards the deep throws and not enough of them were working out for us. So falling back on that rather than falling back on an offense where we can work it under comfortably was incredibly frustrating for me and I almost quit the game. But before I did, I thought I would try out for GB to see how far I'd come. I made it onto the team and I joined Clapham the next year as well. And in those teams I learnt about how to try and initiate flow through rigid set plays to initiate. It was quite structured and organized and sequential and I didn't like it. I thought there must be a better way than this. Some way that's more organic, more adaptable, less prescribed and more enjoyable and free. So since then, a lot of my work has been involved in developing that small game, a set of principles where offense can be sustained comfortably and attacks can be built. I still love the deep game, setting up the cuts, putting the disc out to space. Looking for Shardlow, Shardlow's got space. But I'm more interested in developing that short game, moving the disc in an attacking way, which makes it very difficult for the defense to get a handle on it. And I believe there's potential for a lot more gains from that. Whenever you go to the gym, you make gains and it helps you on the field. But I see that there's massive amounts of gains that can be made mentally through strategy and tactics, which build on the idea of a flowing and sustainable offense. Now, I think the reasoning stands up on its own, but I thought you might be interested in full disclosure, uh, my playing experience, so you can understand a little bit deeper what has helped to shape my opinions and what has motivated me to do this work. My understanding of the game is constantly evolving and this video feels like a bit of a summary of my higher level ideas of offense and defense and the state of the game. I feel a bit bad, like I might have taken something away from Ranola by turning their analysis of their European final victory into something else. But I hope they found these videos interesting and it's kind of enriched their experience of winning the Europeans. This video has been quite a journey to make. Um, I haven't revisited that old footage myself for a long time. I'm probably reaching an age where I've got a lot of stories to tell and I should probably just put most of this in a book for people to read if they're interested. Hive Ultimate's probably going through some changes in the next few months, so stay connected on Discord. Congratulations again to Ranola, especially after losing like 10 games in a row on livestream to then come through and win Europeans is an awesome achievement. In this match, Ranola went big and it paid off for them. Clapham's consistency faltered, some unforced errors crept in and it didn't go their way because of that. So Ranola have got a lot to celebrate and Clapham have got a few things to work on. Clapham need to get their deep game back on form whilst also ironing out the problems with their short game. I'd love to see Ranola sustain possession a bit longer and develop an unstoppable flow game as well, as I think when they match up against 
bigger, more athletic teams, then that's going to have to be what they fall back to. Okay, that about wraps it up for the analysis of this game. It's been like super in-depth, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Do become a patron if you can. You get a free disc, and your support is much appreciated. You get to join Discord and chat to everybody as well. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you again soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Ranala Dublin, your Open 2022 champions.